turn to hymn number 346 and sing, He's got the whole world in his hand. You probably know it by heart, but hymn 346. Let's stand together as we sing. Took a fall, broke both of her kneecaps, 
and I had a whole bunch of screws and hardware placed in her knees, has been recovering ever since. And then last week they decided to undo everything that they did uh, and prepare her for knee replacement surgery. And so I, we definitely need to keep her in our, in our prayers for the upcoming surgery, not sure when yet. But also I, I, I imagine it's pretty discouraging to think that you've already gone through this much recovery and then basically have to start from scratch after that. And so I know she's discouraged and, and I'd like for us to pray for that as well. Uh, and then um, Danny Moore, I, don't, I think I saw him in Sunday school, but he's been having trouble with his back and even worse so since the wreck with the crane out here. And so he had some tests made this past week and, and may also be looking at more surgery. So we'll keep you updated with that, but just keep him uh, in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, Miss Shelby, if she's recovering, I'm so glad that you're doing well enough to be out and about. And, but we just pray that you'll, uh, the, the Lord will heal you up nice and pretty and, and be able to do your, your normal activities soon and very soon. Okay. Yes. Well, I don't really know other than she was supposed to be packing up moving yesterday and then um, somebody shared with me a Facebook post that they were looking for a place to stay. So that, that I've not been able to talk to her since. So definitely keep Myra and Charles uh, in our prayers as well as they try to work through that. So, um, all right. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to come and worship you. Uh, we know, Lord, that, that we sometimes uh, get ourselves in, in a habit of coming here thinking that it's all about us getting fed. And we're thankful, Lord, that, that you do feed us when we come together and share our lives together and study the word together. Uh, but really the, the main heart of why we come here is to, is to express our love to you. Uh, and to share our commitment with you. And so, Lord, we pray that, that you would just help us to be focused today on, on, on thinking about you with everything that is said, everything that is done, every song that is sung, every scripture that is read during the sermon, during every part, during the offering, everything. May our minds and our hearts be focused on you. Uh, we are so thankful that you are our God. We are so thankful that you have revealed yourself to us so that we can know you we're extraordinarily thankful that you, uh, knowing our plight of sin, that you solved the problem for us by, uh, by sending Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for coming into this world and living as a human, just like us, dealing with all that we deal with, uh, and then sacrificing your life for our sin so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be reconciled, so that we can be redeemed, so that we can be adopted into your family so that we can have the promise of eternal life with you and even the promise of a grand inheritance in your kingdom. And we have so very much to be thankful for because of who you are and what you've done and what you continue to do every single day. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we confess that sometimes we are selfish and inward focused and, and just and as long as things are going well for us, we're content with that. But Lord, I pray that you would give each of us a burden for people who don't yet know you, that, that you would give us eyes to see, and that you would give us ears to hear, that you would give us spirits to discern uh, the people that are in our lives, whether it's family or neighbors or coworkers or friends or, or fellow students or just acquaintances, uh, but that, that you would just prick our hearts uh, with uh, with a burden for those who don't yet know you, that, that you would give us uh, an intentionality about our lives uh, that we can intentionally uh, share the good news of Jesus uh, with our friends, with our family, that you would just lay them on our hearts and help us not to be content uh, until uh, we know that we know that they have been exposed to the gospel message. And Lord, I pray for these that are on our prayer list, especially these that we mentioned. I pray for uh, Bobby Jo Ward as she's recovering from, from her um, injuries from the wreck, from, from being hit. I pray for Danny Moore as, as he's uh, anticipating uh, more surgery uh, and, and the 
pain that he's enduring at this time. Just pray that you would heal him and comfort him. I pray for Luann. Uh, we thank you that the procedure went well the other day, and just pray that you would help all the upcoming procedures to go well as to go well and to be productive and helpful. Uh, we pray that you would just give her encouragement and comfort as she goes through this. Uh, we pray for Myra and Charles uh, in their housing situation. We just pray, Lord, that, that you would uh, that you would open some doors for them, that, that you would uh, work some things out and, and straighten that crooked path. That, all these curveballs that have come their way. And we just pray that, that you would help them to get settled in a new place soon and very soon. Open the right doors for that. And we pray for Miss Shelby. We thank you for her recovery and pray for her continued recovery that she would get stronger and stronger and stronger and be able to resume her normal activities soon and very soon. Lord, we just pray that, that you would be pleased with our worship today as we express our love to you. It's in Jesus' name. Holy and precious and perfect name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. If you turn with me in your hymn book to hymn number 342, let's stand together and sing Rock of Ages Cleft for Me, hymn number 342. Precious Heavenly Father, first I thank you that we can come here today and worship you in this beautiful sanctuary. We thank you for the beautiful day that you have given us. And Father, we just pray that each one of us will be blessed with uh, being here today and hearing your word. Maybe Brother Jimmy, as he brings a message to us this morning, we might open our ears to hear that word. And then as we can go forward and talk, speak to the words that he has given to us. Father, we just ask now that you would bless this offering that we're beginning to take as we give back part of what you've given them to us, that we can use it to spread the word of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Amen. Amen.
morning comes from Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, printed at the top of your bulletin page. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. May God bless the reading from his holy word. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, to have your word, that, that you, uh, through your divine hand, made it possible for uh, the inspiration of men to write the words that became our Bible, and that we have it still today, and um, we just thank you that, that you guide us with your word. We pray that as we just meditate on it today, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would teach us. And that we would fill you just with us as, as you do so. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So I bet, I bet I can tell what would happen if I asked all of you to stand up. I'm not, I'm not doing it, but I know what would happen if I asked you to stand up and to move to another seat. Now you might do it. But you wouldn't like me, and you would probably hold it against me, and I bet if I challenged you that when you come in here next Sunday to sit in a different seat, I bet you wouldn't do it. I bet that you would just plop yourself right down, or you always plop yourself down, uh, because that is your spot. It might not have your name on it, 
but it's got your imprint on it, and that's your spot. It just seems that many people are just naturally resistant to change, even when the change would be good for them. Now, I'm sure that when facing with, with a proposed change, we all have either, either heard somebody else say, or perhaps even we ourselves have said something like, we've never done it that way before, or we've always done it this way. And before anybody in this church shakes your head, no, that's baloney, and I call you on baloney. Because I've been here about a year, it'll be a year next week, and I've learned some things of how we've always done it, or we don't do it this way, or we've never done it that way. I'm learning it. I'm learning it. And so, and I, that's just the way we are. We don't like change. Uh, with that logic, uh, people can be pretty stubborn and set in their ways. And so let me transition from kind of that thought to a, a, a little bit of information you may or may not have known. I'm a rail fan. If you don't know what a rail fan is, I like trains. I never grew out of that childhood stage of liking to play with trains and liking to watch trains and all of that. And, I'm, and sometimes, especially when I'm discouraged in ministry, uh, I think I should have joined the railroad. I should have, I should just be on the railroad. And I tell you what was really, 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 really discouraging for me as when I was in between churches and trying to discern God's will, and I was really thinking, well, now would be my time to join the railroad, and I, it became blatantly obvious that I am too old and too out of shape to work on the railroad. And so, nonetheless, did you know, I, I learned this, this little tidbit somewhere along the way, did you know that the standard distance between the rails of the railroad and most U.S. railroads is four feet, eight and a half inches. Does anybody know that? Four feet, eight and a half inches? What in the world? Where did that number come from? What a strange number. Four feet, eight and a half inches. So let me share with you this morning where that number came from. Where the, our, most of our railroads, why those tracks are four feet, eight and a half inches apart? Well, first it was because uh, that's the way they were built in England. Well, what, what difference does that make for us? Well, it was English immigrants who came over here and built our railroads. And so they copied what they used to do over there. Well, why did the English build them that way with that gauge? Well, because the first rail lines uh, were based on kind of pre-rail trams, and that was the gauge that they used over there. Well, why did they use that gauge for the pre-tram uh, over there then? Well, um, because that was the, and the people who built those tramways used the same jigs and tools that they had used to build the wagons, which used that same wheel spacing, four feet, eight and a half inches apart. Why did the wagons uh, have that particular gauge between their wheels? Well, because that was the spacing of the ruts in the old English roads. Well, who built those old English roads? The Imperial Roman Empire uh, built those first long distance roads throughout what is now Europe, and so they could easily mobilize their troops. Well, what caused the ruts in those Imperial Roman roads? It was the uh, Imperial Roman war chariots that caused the ruts in the roads uh, that they built. And so what determined the dimensions of those, those Roman war chariots? They were built to be just wide enough to accommodate the back ends of two horses. <laughs> That's why a Roman chariot was as wide as it was to accommodate the back end of two war horses. So think about that. Kind of backtrack where we've just been on that journey. And some 2,000 plus years later, the United States a standard railroad gauge of four feet, eight and a half inches is derived from the original specifications of a Roman chariot. 
wide enough for the back end of two horses. Now, I think the story gets even more interesting when you think. Did you know that our space shuttles, you know, the, the, this uh, modern day rocket ship that goes up to space and takes our astronauts into space, did you know that our space shuttles were directly impacted by those same dimensions that went all the way back to the Roman chariots and the, the back ends of two horses. Uh, you might remember the, the rockets that the space shuttle, is it, I see other people doing this. Is it hot in here? Can I turn the air down a little bit or get somebody to turn the air down a little bit? Okay, be back. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Probably overdid it and you're probably going to be freezing in a minute. Okay, so you remember the space shuttle. You got this humongous fuel tank and two great big old rockets and then the space shuttle is kind of attached to it. So those two big old rockets that were attached to the fuel tank of the space shuttle, and they were built at a place, at a, at a, a company in Utah. And so the, the, the designers of the space shuttle really wanted those rockets to be bigger. But the designers knew that these rockets would be coming from this plant in Utah by rail. And they knew that that train line that it would be following goes through a tunnel in the mountains. And so, if you've ever been on a train and gone through a tunnel, you know that tunnels are just barely big enough for the train to get through. And so they designed the rockets on the space shuttle to, to be just large enough to squeeze through that tunnel uh, on the train line to get to the launch site. And so you think about that. Our, uh, the world's most advanced transportation, the most advanced transportation system was limited in its design because we've always done it that way. <laughs> that kind of thinking. I wonder, I wonder, and I, I bet you have probably thought this and wondered this or seen this, I wonder how many times churches have sabotaged amazing ministry opportunities with their, we've always done it this way kind of thinking, or we've never done it that way kind of thinking. Now, we actually see Jesus having to deal with the same thing back in New Testament days. In fact, one group of Jesus' parables specifically addressed this kind of, you know, we've always done it this way kind of thinking. And they're recorded in Matthew 9, 14 to 17. We'll cover those verses kind of as we go. If you can join me there if you want to turn in your Bibles. Uh, Matthew 9, 14 to 17. And the telling of these parables took place either during or just after a dinner party at the home of Matthew, the disciple. You remember what his job was? He was a tax collector. And you remember when Jesus said, come follow me, and he agreed to follow Jesus. He then had a great big old party and invited all of his friends to come and meet Jesus. And so either during that party or right around following that party, uh, we see that some of John the Baptist's disciples and followers came and asked Jesus this question in Matthew 9, 14. They asked, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Now, you're familiar with the concept of fasting, whether you've done it or not. I'm sure you're familiar with it, where you refrain from eating for some period of time. Well, fasting was a common practice in Israel at that time. Uh, the, the Pharisees and other faithful Jews, including uh, the disciples of John the Baptist, would fast a couple days every week. Now, the appropriate motive for fasting was to spend time focusing on God and, and trying to get uh, closer in that relationship with God or uh, trying to discern His will. And Jesus actually addressed the issue of fasting in his Sermon on the Mount, which we read about in Matthew chapter 6, 
And surrounding that, apparently there were some, probably Pharisees, who were faithfully carrying out this, uh, this discipline of fasting, uh, but were doing so for the wrong reasons. Uh, were doing so with the wrong motives. Uh, for them, fasting wasn't about seeking God's presence or drawing near to Him uh, at all. Uh, for them, it was about following rules so that they could look righteous to the people around them. Or even worse, it was, uh, we're told in that in the passage, that they would try to make themselves look pitiful uh, when they were fasting so they could get the attention of other people, so that they could appear like they were, were godly, or they could appear like they were pious, so that they could get the attention of others. And so they were doing it for the wrong reasons. Uh, well, John's disciples uh, may have asked that question about fasting. Why, why don't your disciples fast like these others? Uh, but really, you can kind of sense they had a deeper question. They, they had some, some deeper concerns than just about fasting. That was their, their way of kind of uh, breaking the ice to, to, to kind of gauge something else. You, you remember uh, when John the Baptist had been put in jail, and he sent some of his followers to Jesus to ask, are you really the one? Are you really the Messiah? And so I think that's kind of what these disciples are kind of digging for. Uh, is Jesus really the Messiah? Perhaps they wanted to ask, how can you be the Messiah if you don't even do the things that our, our religious leaders are doing, such as fasting? And this was not altogether different from another question that Jesus got at that same uh, party uh, at, at Matthew's house. We talked about it a couple weeks ago where they asked in Matthew 9, 11, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? That too, we talked about how it really had a deeper question uh, than what was actually being asked. In their minds, Jesus and his disciples were not following all of the man-made rituals and rules that righteous Jews and especially Jewish leaders were supposed to follow. So what are we to think if you're not even doing what our religious leaders are doing? Are you really the Messiah? Are you really a, a Jewish leader if you're not doing what, what these other guys are doing? So Jesus was not meeting their expectations of a religious leader and certainly not of what they expected of the Messiah. So Jesus responded to their question with telling a couple parables. The first one we call the parable of the bridegroom. In this, Jesus directly addressed their question about fasting. He drew their attention to some familiar imagery of a wedding feast. He said in Matthew 9:15. How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is still with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. So his listeners, I mean, common sense, his listeners knew that when the groom is there, you party. When the groom's not there, then the party goes away. They, they knew that imagery, and so Jesus was playing on that, teaching a, a divine truth that we, we see in the book of Revelation and other places in the Old Testament that Jesus really is the bridegroom of God. And so Jesus was, was kind of giving them a clue of who he was. Uh, in this parable, he used this simple and familiar imagery to reveal two important truths about himself as the Messiah. First, he was saying to them that he was much more than their human, political, selfish, worldly expectations uh, about the Messiah. Uh, he had no intentions whatsoever of meeting their worldly expectations because their worldly expectations of the Messiah were wrong, uh, were misunderstood. And so he wasn't uh, going to do that. Uh, he... he uh, was more than that. In fact, we're told when Jesus was born, one of his names would be Emmanuel. You remember what Emmanuel means? God with us. And so Jesus was saying that the bridegroom uh, 
And really, the bigger picture, God is with us. So this is not an appropriate time to fast about it and to try to draw near to him, to God through fasting, because God in the flesh is here with them. And so he was saying that he would be more than what they were expecting. And that his presence as God with them was, was a good reason for them to rejoice and not to fast. Uh, as long as God in the flesh was with them, they wouldn't need to do that. And second, Jesus implied that he, the divine bridegroom, would not always be with them. Uh, that in the days ahead, uh, that they would need to fast in order to draw near to him. He was hinting at, at how he was going to die, and that he would die for the sins of the world, and that he would be taken away violently. And so by, and by telling them that ahead of time, by giving them that kind of prophecy or prediction, Jesus clarified that his future suffering and death uh, were a part of God's redemptive plan. And so he was kind of showing them that, that there was a bigger picture than what they were accustomed to thinking about, even with the Messiah. So in Jesus' next parables, the next two parables, and though he continued to use familiar imagery, he kind of left the topic about fasting. He, he wasn't talking about fasting anymore. Rather, he, he was really addressing those deeper concerns that he sensed that they had about uh, whether he was the Messiah or not. Um, so we see in Matthew 9, 16, he said, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. His listeners would have known that a new patch would shrink as soon as it was washed the first time, uh, which would uh, ruin both the patch and the garment. Uh, and then he continued with the third parable, 9, 17. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skin will burst, and the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Jesus' listeners would have been familiar with that imagery as well. That, uh, it takes uh, a new wineskin uh, with its elasticity and to accommodate the fermentation process with those gases building up, uh, if you put new wine into an old wine skin that couldn't expand, it would bust and, and break both the wine skin and ruin the wine. So Jesus used these two parables um, to teach us that the Messiah, as the Messiah, he was offering a brand new model of leadership. He was offering, uh, or he was, he was inviting people to be a part of an upside-down kingdom, a kingdom that it was exactly opposite of what they were being taught by the religious leaders of that day. So he was not concerned about meeting their expectations. He was not going to follow their man-made rules and rituals. He, he always followed God's commands that God specifically gave. Uh, but not all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of extra rules that, that these uh, leaders had made to kind of guard themselves. Uh, he wasn't going to do that. Um, many years earlier, through the prophet Isaiah, God had proclaimed, we read this as our focal passage, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, uh, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Through these parables, Jesus was kind of making a similar statement. Uh, that, that what I am doing, what I am here to do, who I am, is bigger than, than you think. It's not just what you expect. It's not just your ways. He was offering them something better than what they were expecting. Jesus made it clear that he had no intentions of modeling the leadership model of that day. And in, in Mark 10, 42 to 45, Jesus taught this lesson to his disciples. This is New Living Translation. He said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them, 
but among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus planned to change the culture altogether. Instead of leading with power and force, Jesus initiated a culture of leading with service and love. And that was the, that was the new model that he was giving his followers and that they, they followed as well. And that they were to follow his example of washing feet. That they were to follow his example of serving and caring for other people. Not to, not to be uh, the rulers over anybody, but to serve uh, through or to lead through service. So here's the interesting thing about Jesus' parables. They usually come from a problem, such as this question, why don't y'all fast like all the good Jews do? They usually stem from a, a specific problem, and Jesus usually answers the problem through the parable, but he does something, he accomplishes something bigger than that as well. He also used his parables to teach deeper truths about God's kingdom. And because the religious leaders of his day held and taught erroneous, wrong views about God and about God's kingdom, Jesus used these parables to correct the people's misunderstandings uh, about God, about his kingdom. So as a result of John's disciples asking this question about fasting, and Jesus was able to teach them a few important truths about the kingdom of God. For instance, first, Jesus made it clear that the kingdom of God would be completely different from the view of the kingdom being presented by the religious leaders uh, of that day. Uh, for one thing, uh, it would be uh, more based on a personal relationship with God than on following rules and following rituals. Uh, further, uh, entry into God's kingdom would be based on Christ's sacrifice of atonement rather than on our own good deeds and following the right rituals and rules and stuff. And not on your own righteousness, is based on Christ's righteousness. Another lesson he taught, uh, he said that the kingdom of God would be permeated with God's presence. No matter where you are in the kingdom of heaven, you will be able to sense God's presence with you. And then third, Jesus taught that because God will be ever present, the kingdom of God will be a place of rejoicing and celebration. There will be no need for fasting, no need for mourning in any way. It would be a different kingdom from what they were, what those religious leaders of that day uh, were teaching. Now, I'm going to close with an illustration that's probably going to come across as really cheesy. And maybe it is, but I still think that it, it kind of fits. My, my kids have no concept of this, uh, but when I was, I don't know, probably between Max and Lily's age and Devin's age, I, I can't exactly remember when it was, but I remember when the first video games came out. Um, first at the arcade, where you'd have to actually go to a mall or go to an arcade to play your video games and put your quarters in, for that was, Good old days back then where a video game was just a quarter instead of a dollar fifty or two dollars. Uh, but I remember when the first home video game units came out. I remember my first one, it was called the Atari 2600. And man, I loved that Atari 2600. And I played it, and I played it, and I played it, and I played it, and I played it. Hours and hours and hours and game after game after game. I loved playing my Atari 2600. Well, I don't know how long I had that Atari 2600 before the Atari, was it 5200? Was that like the next one? 5200 came out. And that gummit, you couldn't play the 2600 games or the 5200 units. So I had a decision to make. Now I, I played like I have a decision to make. Like I, 
Now, it was a, a great sacrifice for me to, to do away with my 2600 and grab or have my beg my parents to buy me the Atari 5200 so that I could learn uh, those games and play those games. I'd say that it would be a sacrifice, but I was begging whether it was or not. Please, can I get the 5200? Please, can I get the 5200? And so, but I had to, I had to come to grips with, I really enjoyed my 2600. I liked those games. Uh, I, I was used to those games. I was, I was getting pretty good at those games. To, to leave that behind and to go to a new system and have to buy new games and have to learn the new games, I, I was always weary. I, is it going to be worth it? Maybe I should just play my old games that I'm already good at. But you know what I learned? It was always worth it. It was always worth it. The new systems always had better graphics and better games and were always, always better. And had I not chosen to, to, uh, to leave my old system behind and start playing the games of the new system, I would have been the one who missed out. Now, do not hear that as a as an as a invitation for y'all to beg for the next system that comes out every time. You've got all that you need. Stick with the old system. You're good with the old system. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't even know the, the difference of quality in today's game versus what we played, do they? Well, Jesus, I told you it was cheesy, but, but you kind of see the point. Jesus had come into the world to invite people to be a part of the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, the religious leaders of that day were leading people astray with their wrong teachings, their erroneous views of God and of God's kingdom. So Jesus was trying to convince them that he didn't come to just fulfill their old way. He came to give a new way that was new and improved and better than they could even imagine. He was coming to give them something greater than they were thinking. But to be a part of that, of what he was offering, they would have to change their thinking. They would have to give up what was going wrong in their, in their system. And they would have to embrace the truth of what he was teaching about the kingdom of God. More than that, they would have to embrace him as the truth of the new system that he was teaching. And unfortunately, a lot, a lot, a lot were content with their familiar but erroneous way of thinking and were unwilling to turn to Jesus and to take that step to, to what he was teaching about the kingdom of God. In their stubbornness, they rejected God's invitation to join him forever and ever through all eternity in God's kingdom. That's pretty sad, isn't it? That's just, that's just sad. But isn't that, what, isn't that the boat that people are in all around us today? That they know this world, they're comfortable with this world, they're happy with this world, even though if they took a second or two to think about it, this world is letting them down. This world is disappointing them. This world is, uh, is not very fulfilling in the big scheme of things because we were made for eternity. And this world, uh, as is, was, uh, is not meeting that need. Only Jesus can meet that need. And so in their, in their contentment in the ways of this world, people are hesitant to join into the kingdom of God because of whatever reasons. They, they're content or they're scared or they don't know or they haven't heard or whatever reasons. They're, they're in the same boat. And so we actually face the same decision today as well. Jesus' invitation is still being extended to you today. We're told that when he started his earthly ministry, uh, that he traveled around saying in Matthew 4, 17 and 19, he said, Everywhere he went, traveling to all these little towns, he said, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then we see that he went on to his first disciples and he said, 
come follow me. Join me in this new kingdom that I am offering you. No matter how much you have to give up in order to accept his invitation, I assure you that the kingdom of God is worth it. That the kingdom of God is better than you can even imagine. And so, yes, it's scary to give up what we know and what we're comfortable with. But it's worth it. It's worth it. What he's offering us is better. And so Jesus charged in Matthew 6, 33, may, may this be our goal every single day. Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Seek first the kingdom of God. When we get up in the morning, seek first the kingdom of God. When we're about halfway through our day, remind yourself, seek first the kingdom of God. There's more than this. There's more and something better than this. When we're, when we're living as part of the kingdom of God that Jesus has invited us to be a part of. So won't you, if you haven't already, choose God's kingdom today. Don't let another day pass without embracing the, the love and the grace of Jesus so that you too can be a part of this kingdom that he is offering. And it all started with a question about fasting. But Jesus got to the heart of the matter. Fasting, fasting is a great way, a great discipline to, to help you focus on God, to help you kind of get in a, a mindset to discern God's will. It's a great discipline. But there's more to life than that discipline. Uh, we have been promised life with Jesus in his kingdom. Not just someday when we die, but as soon as you accept Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, we are part of his kingdom. And what is a kingdom? It's, it's, some, it's, a, it's a territory or it's a space that is ruled by a king. Well, is your space ruled by your king, Jesus? That's how we should think every day. I'm, I'm surrendering my life to the rule of my king, King Jesus, because he, his rule is better than I can do on my own. His, his, his ways are better than I can come up with on my own. So let's live for his kingdom each and every day. This morning, I'm not sure where you are in your faith journey. My assumption is that all of us here have accepted Jesus somewhere along the way, that we're all his followers, uh, but I don't know. And I, I also, I know this, that sometimes, and I'm not saying this about anybody, don't hear me wrong. I have seen many, many, many times people who have been in the church for a long, long time who just have an epiphany just out of the blue after hearing something from God's word or, or, or some experience of coming to the realization that I don't know that I got it. I, I don't know that I fully understood this gospel thing that, that I claim that I've been following all along. So maybe, maybe today search your heart and ask yourself, do I know that I know that I know that uh, Jesus is God? Do I know that I know that I know that Jesus came into this world as a man, that he's fully God and fully man, and, and that he lived a perfect, sinless life? Do I know that I know that I know? Do I believe with all that's in me that he died for me because of my sin? That's where we need to begin, really. He didn't have to come into this world and die if it wasn't for our sin. So we can't be right with him if we've never acknowledged that we need a Savior, that we have no need of a Savior. So we have to come to grips with our sin. And then we have to uh, come to grips with who he is. And we have to come to grips that, that his sacrifice on that cross was effective. Not, not just one time, but was effective for the rest of my life. When I put my trust in him, that his blood is sufficient to make me right with God from here on out. And then I can live that way in that kind of relationship. So just think and pray and meditate sometimes. Am, am I fully involved? Am I fully engaged in God's kingdom? Have I, have I truly gotten it? Am I truly living it? Am I, am I truly living in that relationship with Jesus and then being guided? 
by the Holy Spirit and, and, and digging into his word for his truth and trying to live by his truth. And, and am, am I in it? Am I really in the kingdom of God and uh, living uh, as if it's my highest priority? Uh, hopefully the answer is yes. That's, that's my heart's desire for me and for you is that the answer to that is yes. That we're all in. Uh, that we're all in for Jesus and his kingdom. But if not, there's, uh, he has provided every way we need of getting right with him. So this morning, let's close with uh, hymn of response number 411. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Let's stand together as we sing. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, remember, uh, we have a VBS volunteers meeting right after the service. Shouldn't take a couple minutes. Uh, we'd love to see uh, all of you, as many of you as possible, to help out with the VBS. There's all kinds of uh, parts to play with it. Um, teaching parts and, and crafts and games and, and food and music and all kinds of parts. Um, helping kids get around from place to place. Uh, all kinds of parts to play with that, decorating. And so um, think about it, pray about it. Uh, in fact, how about how about this? I'm going to cheat a little bit. Okay, I'm going to assume that all of you are going to stay for our VBS meeting anyway. Okay, so thank you, VBS volunteers. I'm so glad that you decided to stay for our meeting. And so, which day works better? August 13th yes. or August 6th? 13th? 13th. Or 6th? 6th. Can y'all not do the 13th? And y'all were all doing the wreck? Sixth, they can't.
you just jump in? Okay. 13th of this. Okay. Let's close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your wonderful, awesome, amazing grace. You are, you are so precious, Lord. Thank you for, for loving us so much. Help us to process that every single day, how much you love us, what you've done for us, what you continue to do for us and 